Welcome. Now that the simulation concluded, we can have a look at the output that FDS creates. FDS can produce a lot of output depending on what the user specified before running the simulation. Let's start out with covering some of the basic output that is created without that the user has explicitly specified it. This basic information is also sufficient to figure out if the gas burner was set up correctly. I would also like to direct your attention to chapter 27. In here the different output file formats are discussed in a bit more detail. In the simulation directory, next to the FDS input file, we also find the smoke view file with which we have already interacted. Smoke view will show us a graphical representation of the results from the simulation. The S3D files contain information about the smoke movement and will be called from smoke view. The gittxt contains the FDS version number. This is the same information that is provided if you go to your terminal and type in FDS. One of the first lines coming up starts with revision and after it is the same version number. If you write a text that concerns FDS, for example your thesis, a journal article or a conference contribution, this revision line is what you need to provide at least once in the beginning to make sure that everybody knows which specific FDS version you have been using during your simulations. This is important if other people would like to reproduce your work, then they can use the exact same FDS version. Next I want to briefly talk about the steps file. The step file contains information about how the time step size changes during the course of the FDS simulation. For example, in a domain the gas velocities may change and this will likely impact the time step size. We can see here that up to time step 20 the step size did not change, afterwards it gets smaller. This is when the fire really starts ramping up. This information can be interesting for debugging. The CPU file contains information about how the overall computing time was distributed over the different subroutines. In our case we are having a simulation with a single mesh and a single MPI process. Therefore there is not much information in this file. Just a single line for rank 0 which is our first MPI process. The columns afterwards contain the times that were spent on the major subroutines. This information can nicely be presented in a bar chart. Here I am using the column headers also as the labels for the data series. We can see here for example that the velocity or radiation subroutines consume relatively large amounts of computing time. We can see also that subroutine number 7 does not consume any computing time. If we look here into the legend, number 7 would be the particles. Since no particles are used inside the simulation, no computing time can be consumed. Similar things are true for the HVAC or geoms or vegetation. I have created here a new plot in which I have excluded the subroutines which are not part of our simulation. As an example I did run a simulation with two meshes. One at the bottom and one at the top. Each of these meshes uses a single MPI process. If we have a look into the respective CPU files, we see that there is now two lines, one for each rank, meaning one for each MPI process. This information can be used to compare the performance of the individual meshes. So for example you can use this to optimize your mesh layout. Here I have created a stacked bar chart, one for each mesh. What is obvious here is that the individual subroutines take different amounts of time depending on in which mesh we are looking. For example you can have mesh layouts where most of the computation is happening in a few meshes and most of the other meshes are idle. It is also pointed out in the user guide that you can look for the main process. If one MPI process spends more time in main that means it is idling and waiting for the other process. As an example I am showing here the time spent in main for both meshes. We see here that mesh number 2 takes a lot of time in main which means it is waiting a lot on mesh number 1. That makes sense and so far that the combustion itself is happening in mesh number 1. The out file contains the diagnostics of the conducted simulation. This will be a lot of information, thus I only cover it briefly. Further details will be provided in other videos when it is appropriate. In the beginning we get an overview over the FDS version used. This is the same output that we see in the terminal when we start FDS. An overview over the computational domain is provided, like the physical dimensions or the number of cells. Furthermore there is also information about the different submodels that are used. For example the simulation mode. There is also an overview provided about the settings of the pressure solver as well as how the background pressure changes over the height of the domain. Fairly detailed information is provided about the gas species involved in our simulation. For example here we have three different species involved. One would be the background species air, the combustible gas methane and the products that are being produced in the combustion reaction of the methane. Air and products are lumped species that are consisting of multiple subspecies. This is easily to see for air for example which consists out of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide and water vapor. After the mixtures, information about the individual gas species are provided. And also more detailed information about the lumped species, for example the air. Details on the gas phase combustion reactions are available as well. For example which fuel was used and its heat of combustion. We will look at this again when we talk about the heat release rate that we wanted to set up for the gas burner. FDS also provides you with stoichiometric coefficients. These have been determined during the simple chemistry that FDS uses for the combustion in its default setup. Furthermore, you would find here information about the materials that have been defined as well as the boundary conditions. In our case we have only defined a gas burner, so this information is presented here. 
Further information for the radiation model is available, for example the radiation angles and the time steps that are used to update the radiation field. At the end of the file is an overview over the runtime diagnostics. Here you get information for each time step, for example the velocity errors and how many pressure iterations have been conducted. FDS provides you with information where specific errors are happening inside the domain. For example, let's focus here on the maximum velocity error. It tells us that at time step 1, the maximum velocity error was happening in mesh 1. And it gives us a specific cell location in x, y and z coordinates. Furthermore, we get an information how much of the total simulation time has elapsed. The time steps that are presented here following the same order that you see in the terminal. Note here, for example, that the time step output changes in the terminal from time step 10 to time step 20, and the same information is provided in the out file. In the end, we get a message how FDS concluded the simulation. In this particular case, nothing out of the ordinary happened, and FDS could complete successfully. We are also provided with information about how long the simulation itself took. This is what is referred to as the wall clock time. The wall clock time is the time that passes in the real world, as opposed to the time over which the simulation is to be conducted. This can be imagined as follows. You sit in your office and start a simulation. You look at the clock on the wall to note down the start time. Once the simulation concluded, you look at the clock on the wall again to note down the time it ended. The difference in between is the time that has passed to actually run the simulation. The total time is the time that has passed inside the simulation. In this case here, this means for a simulation conducted over 20 seconds, in the real world nearly 130 seconds have passed. The time stepping time was consumed by all the major processes. Basically, you sum up all these contributions to end at the time stepping time. There's a small difference here with respect to the total elapsed time. I assume this time is consumed by initializing the overall simulation as well as winding it down. Now let's have a look at the HRR file. The HRR file contains information about the heat release and the energy conservation. You find more details on this in the section heat release rate and energy conservation in the user's guide. The terms on the right hand side of equation 22.20 are provided in the HRR file. The columns after the time are the heat release rate, Q radiation, Q convection and so forth. There is further Q total, which is the sum of all terms on the right hand side. The value for the sensible enthalpy should be the same as the sum of all the terms on the right hand side. We can plot the enthalpy change over the course of the simulation. If we plot Q total into the same plot, we should see that they are basically overlapping, which is the case here. Furthermore, we could also sum up all the individual components, which should be equal to Q total and also overlap with the rest, which it does. Let's have a look at the gas burner now. According to the experiment, we wanted to have a gas burner that has a constant heat release rate of 57.5 kW per square meter. To figure out where we are at with the simulation, we can simply plot the heat release rate against time. In this plot, we will see that FDS will ramp up the heat release rate in the beginning. After this initial ramp up, it stays fairly constant. This is the result of us providing the heat release rate per unit area to the surface. We could change this gas flow with a ramp. If you are interested in that, you can have a look in the user guide for the ramp Q. We will also discuss this later. The HRR PUA parameter is a convenience function within FDS. It allows us to easily define a mass flux of some combustible gas over a certain surface area. The value for this parameter is provided in kilowatt per square meter. So in our case this means if you would have a burner with an edge length of 1 meter, the total heat released over this surface area would be 57.5 kW. However, the edge length of our gas burner is 30 centimeters. Since the surface area of this burner is much smaller than 1 square meter, also the total heat released is much smaller. So the value is roughly one tenth of the desired output. I've drawn a dashed line into this plot, indicating the roughly 9% of the desired heat release rate. And we see this matches. Based on the unit of the HRR PUA parameter, we can easily compute what the correct value would be that we need to put in. We can simply divide the desired heat release rate by the burner surface area. So the value that we need to put in is around 638.9 kW per square meter. I changed the value here and did run the simulation again. Now it's called C5 underscore B. If we now plot the heat release rate against time, we see that it matches the target value. There is some fluctuation happening here as a result of the turbulence in the gas flow. We have been talking now all the time about the heat release rate, but I said before that the HRR PUA produces the mass flux. So how exactly is FDS coming to this value then? We can have another look in the HRR file and see that there's also a couple of mass loss rates being presented. The mass loss rate of air, the mass loss rate for methane and the mass loss rate for the products. These are the gaseous species that we have already seen in the out file. Also remember that in the out file, a value for the heat of combustion for the combustible gas is presented. We can use this value for the heat of combustion with the mass loss rate for methane to compute what the heat release rate should look like. This is demonstrated in this plot here with the black dashed dotted line. FDS, however, does the same computation backwards. 
you provide a value for the heat release rate, FDS knows what the heat of combustion is and from this calculates backwards what the mass loss rate needs to be. Only the methane is released from a boundary into the gas phase domain. The air is the background species and is always present. Therefore, the mass loss rate for air is zero. The products, on the other hand, are the result of the chemical reaction for the combustion. So even so the methane is released from the boundary, the products are not. Thus, the mass loss rate for products is also zero throughout this simulation, even so the amount of products being produced is non-zero. Again, the reason is because this is happening in the gas phase. Just be aware that the values from the HIR column and the mass loss rate multiplied with the heat of combustion do not necessarily have to match. For example, you could have a situation where some of the combustible gas leaves the domain before being burned. This would then not show up in the HIR column. There, only the heat released inside the computational domain will be tracked. Now we have the simulation with the wrong setup for the gas burner on the left hand side and the simulation with the corrected HRR PUA value on the right hand side. With this you should now be able to ensure for your own simulations that you have set up the heat release rate for your gas burner correctly. Next we will talk about how to set up devices so that we can record different quantities from the simulation. Thank you very much and have a nice day.